Hi there, Rick Hansen with Amazing Greats. And today we talk with a guy that played football at the highest level. He was also one of the dozen pro athletes that founded Professional Athletes Outreach, POA, which has been active for over 50 years. And although he got a C in speech class, he spoke to over 200,000 people in Dallas at the Dallas Expo 72 during the Jesus Revolution. He's also spoken with thousands of inmates during years of prison ministry. And today he speaks at Catholic schools all over America. And he is speaking with us today on Amazing Greats. You're gonna love the life journey of Mike McCoy. Last year, Mike McCoy, number 76, enjoyed his finest season in pro football. And in time, the real McCoy himself must be recognized as one of the premier performers in the game. We're here today with Mike McCoy. And Mike, I was just explaining that normally I have this wonderful backdrop that says amazing greats and all that. But for today's show, for some reason, technology has um, baffled me. And so I am just going to go with uh, the blur look. And so let me, let me do the introductions. Mike McCoy is a football star in Notre Dame. Uh, he's played, I believe, like eight uh, years in the NFL, Love. most notably Love. with um, Green Bay Packers. He also played with Oakland and New York. Um, and you had uh, a good stint of football in your in your high school days as well. All right. So we're going to talk about football a little bit. But more importantly, we're going to talk about how football has impacted your life and more importantly, how Jesus Christ has impacted your life. So that's where we're going to go with all of this. Okay. Welcome, Mike. Thanks, Rick. Um, I played 11 years. Those last four years were tough. So <laughs> I, I played 11 years, seven with Green Bay, two with the Raiders and two with the New York Giants. Yikes. And, uh, not too many guys make it past three years. So I don't know if I was blessed or not, but uh, we were able to get her done. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, you, with all of that in your, in your story and, and you've got a great story. F football was just a, a little piece of it, really. When you start looking at the, the whole deal, yeah, when, uh, you're old, when you get as old as I am, absolutely. <laughs> and, and myself as well. Um, so, but let's start with the, um, you, you, you kind of had a rocky start uh, to this thing called life. Um, tell us a little bit about your, yeah, I grew days. up in Erie, Pennsylvania. And uh, unfortunately, my dad, dad made some bad choices when I was in third or fourth grade. So uh, he lost uh, his state farm business, and uh, we had to move in with my grandparents. And they were great people, John and Alice Spadaga, in Erie, Pennsylvania. And we were in Meadville, which is 50 miles north. But it's, you know, in third and fourth grade, it's like moving across country. Yeah. Because, you know, you lose all your friends, and it's a new atmosphere, even though we've been up there many times. And I had some great family connections with the Polish side of the family. My mother was Polish. She was first generation, second generation. And my grandfather came over in 1918 to avoid the Russian army. How about that? Coming wow. into Poland, taking all the kids. So my great-great-grandmother stuck the two oldest boys in a boat, came through Erie, came through uh, the uh, immigration system in, in uh, Canada. They were sponsored because you had to be sponsored back then, sponsored by family in Erie, and he went to work and learned English and learned how to barefoot box and and wrestle and he worked at a Polish National Alliance Club and wow. learned English and uh opened up his little opened up his own business and it was called Crown Bottling Works. So he was you know five foot six, about 170 pounds and just just solid. And and even even at age 74, he's five foot six, 170 pounds. Wow. So that was a little difficult time. And uh, so my dad had many, many different jobs. And I love my dad. And he was he was an alcoholic, and um, he was a uh, a fun alcoholic, if you want to call it that. You know, you have different alcoholics yeah. that are morbid and angry, but he was you know fun, and uh, everybody loved Tom and the big Irish guy, and he was the he was always the one who ran the beer tent in for <laughs> for the Catholic uh, for the Catholic bazaars, and uh, so um, it was just a big. Big kid, fifth grade, five foot five, 165 pounds, didn't play football, was too too fat, and started playing a little baseball and basketball. Emotionally, those are rugged days for you, right? Because absolutely just yeah. like this big I had kid, a great right? support system, you know, with my mother, who was a six foot hundred and eighty-pound Polish lady, my grandparents, 
and my cousins, you know, and and uh, the Spraga family and my faith, St. John the Baptist Church, the priest, the nuns up there. <clears throat> so I had some good friends. So all those things helped me get through through that time that if I didn't have those things, you know, it would have probably been a different story, even though it's still d- difficult because you're, you're in third, fourth, fifth grade, you don't know what's going on. And then uh, I got a call to become a priest. That's what Father Teller said. And he came into the eighth, seventh grade guys and said, all you guys have a calling to be a priest. You know, it's like the insurance managers come in. All you guys are going to be insurance agents. So they threw them up on the wall and whoever stuck made it. And uh, so I went to St. Mark's Seminary for a year and didn't turn out. A lot of things happened up there. And uh, I was I was gonna, I was going to leave the seminary after my freshman year. And I was going to go to Academy High School where my mother went because Cathedral Prep High School is an all-boys school in the area, and there was 1,200 of them at the time. There's no room for those sissy seminarians. That's what Monsignor McDonald said. <laughs> yeah. Until someone told him, he says, Monsignor, this sissy seminarian played basketball, and he, he started playing a little football with the seminarian students, but he's he's 6'3", six, six, about 240 pounds, and wears a size 15 cleat. So I was in. <laughs> That's how I like a football prep. player to me. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Tony Zambrowski was the coach, line coach at the time really became my mentor. And I didn't realize that at the time. He grew up in an alcoholic family, so he pretty much knew what I was going through. So he helped me develop and taught me the game of football. And his family um, uh, wrapped around me also, and and his wife and his and his kids. And I got to know them very, very well. Unfortunately, both have passed. And um, and so he just, uh, you know, just really helped me. And then the one thing he did help me with was uh, go off for wrestling after football my sophomore year. And I said, okay, never wrestled before. You know, Erie was a pretty good wrestling town, and they had they had guys who had these uh, gyms in their garages that you'd go down there on Friday night and you wrestle, you know, east yeah. side of Erie, you know, tough, tough. You, and so I started any, wrestling. Uh, were you in the unlimited weight class or where, where, where did I you? I was heavyweight. Yeah, yeah, heavyweight. Yeah. That's oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Unlimited, unlimited. <laughs> and uh, so I started to wrestle. I did very well, and that that changed me into a better football player. I became more aggressive my junior year. I went both ways, and um, I just still loved it. And so I continued to play football and wrestle, and and uh, started making all star teams and all city stuff. And all right, well, let me good. let me pause here because this is where I'm going to throw you off guard. I told you I was going to. Sure. Yeah, this is going to be the life lesson lightning round. Sure. So I've got um, some people that I know are important in your life. And I'm just going to ask you, give me the the lesson that you think that they stand out for you in your in your lifelong sure. uh, endeavors. So number one is Tony Zambrowski. Right. What, what was his life lesson that you can remember and is sticks out? Well, I think I went through a lot of it. He became my mentor and he guided me through these tough times. Uh, and he he just kept, kept encouraging me. And he says, where do you want to go to college? I said, college, what's that? You know, my sister went, she was the only one, but it, it was a college, it was a PA college, Polish National Alliance College of Cambridge Springs, PA. And I said, I don't know. And that was my junior year. So he started planting the seeds of my future. And uh, by the time I reached my senior year, I had multiple offers and uh, he guided me through those. He actually took me out to Notre Dame the springtime of my junior, he, he and his wife, Maria. And I went to the spring game and I met Eric Parsegan. And I said, wow, yeah, that was his second year, I think, at Notre Dame at the time. This program was coming around. It was an all-boys Catholic school, 5,000. But I still went to Syracuse and Indiana and uh, Penn State, and I visited them, and I signed. I committed before Christmas my senior year. Okay, that's number two, lightning round, life lessons, era Parsegian. Uh, great character, great personality. Uh, he kept the, kept the line between authority and friend. And uh, you just felt that no matter who you were up against and what team you're going to play, that we had the edge because of Era and his expertise as a player. Well, he was a player for the Cleveland Browns. He got hurt. Not only that, but as a coach and the game plans. So you always felt going into the game that, you know, we got this. just because of Era and what he did during the week and prepared us. Yeah. Uh, and he was, um, he was, he was your coach all the way through Notre Dame. And that was where you really became a star is, is at Notre Dame. I mean, you got awards, yeah. you were, yeah. you were, you were the the big deal at that point. That was a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. I was. I, that's a proud of word. I was, but he had, I'm trying to remember the phrases. He said, there's no circumstances we cannot overcome. And that was one of his phrases. Then his other phrase, he hold up a fist. 
And you say, you take one finger away, you lose, you lose the power of the fist. So when we go in there as a team, playing as a team together, uh, that was big for us too. I love that. Uh, yeah. yeah, and a lot of other phrases too, but those were the two big ones that I remember. All right, and so and Johnny Ray was my uh, linebacker coach, and Joe Yanto was my line coach, and these guys had great influence on me also. And and, and I, you you were you stood out as such a you know a star at that time that you were drafted right out of the gate as soon as you left Notre Dame, right? Yeah, whatever the draft was at that time. You gotta understand that was 1970. No okay. ESPN, no money. The leagues merged between AFL and NFL. And so I was heading off to law school. That was my goal at the time. And I went to class it was in February and it was snowing in South Bend. And I, and I had a phone call to call Pat Pepler from the Green Bay Packers because the draft was on, but there was no publicity at all. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so I called him up. He says, you've just been drafted by the Green Bay Packers. So I said, I appreciate that. <laughs> That was it. I didn't hear from him again until I went up there in April to sign my big contract for eighteen thousand dollars. Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! Whoa, yeah. eighteen grand just like that. that was I like to tell people it was BM before money. <laughs> and uh, Terry Bradshaw was number one. He went to the Steelers, and I went to Green Bay. Uh huh. So Green Bay was a, a great experience. Uh, a little bit, just a quick question. You were not there during the Vince Lombardi years, but no, no, but a lot must of have been guys. some impact from those years. Oh yeah. I mean, Vince, Vince still has impact up there, but he died September 6, 1970, which is my birthday. And he was already gone to Washington. You know, Bart Starr was still there. Dave Robinson was still there. Ray Nishka was still there. Uh, Bob Skronsky was still there. Um, uh, there's lots of guys, Woody Wood, there's, t uh, um, Lionel Aldridge is still there. So there's a lot of guys from that era, Gail Gillingham, who I practice every day, but killed me every day. And uh there was so there's a lot of a lot of guys left over from the from the Barty era. So my rookie year, we had Phil Banks and we didn't do very good. They fired him and they hired Dan Devine. So I played for Dan Devine. Um difficult years. We did win a national, did win a central division title in 72. And we had a young quarterback named Scott Hunter. Because Bart was done, you know, he had surgery on his shoulder, couldn't pass, so he became quarterback coach. And we made the playoffs. We played the Redskins. We lost sixteen to seven. And we had MacArthur Lane and John Brockington. We had the running game. And Dan and Dan and Dan and Bart were arguing on the sideline because Bart wanted it open up because they had eight guys in the box. And you, you know, and I don't care how tough you are, you're not going to run against eight guys in the box. Yeah, yeah. So Bart went over here. Dan went over there. We lost the game, sixteen to seven, and that was Bart the year Starr. that uh, that was the year Miami went seventeen to zero. Bart Starr was, uh, you know, everywhere you turn, this is the epitome of of a great man, um, a great Christian guy. Uh, did 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 was he a Christian, a solid Christian at that point? I'm pretty sure he was. I mean, his character was impeccable, and how he spoke and how he carried himself. And I saw him in Erie one time at the beachcomber and they were brought in all these different guys and they brought in uh mickey mantle and he wasn't he did not have a good night let's put it that way and uh, bart was phenomenal and just class act his wife cherry his his kids you know he had one son uh lose his life he, he uh, overdosed on drugs oh, so my. bart bart did not have an easy life you know most of us don't and uh and so he got involved with uh a boys camp and uh outside of green bay and he did everything he can to make sure these boys had a chance to get through life. But the real influence for you, Christi Christianity-wise, is uh, Carol Dale, right? Yeah, I call him my spiritual dad. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I had faith. I knew who God was. I knew who Jesus Christ was. Went to church all the time. Um, but there was something missing. I said, what is, you know, what is missing? I'm, I'm trying to obey the law. And I couldn't do it. And it frustrated me. So a lot of my friends at Notre Dame, and there were Protestants and Methodists at Notre Dame, if you can believe that, who kind of had the same experience with their religion. And, uh, and you got to understand, that was a different church back then, back in 67, 68, 69. You know, that's why all the hippies went out, out to California, you know, because they, they, you know, they wanted to find meaning in life. Wow. And, <laughs> and, I, and I want to talk, I want to touch on that too, because, oh, yeah. And, uh, and all that. So I just, uh, so when Carol Dale and his wife uh, came into our lives, um, he was very, very instrumental, very quiet guy, grew up in West Virginia. Uh, his parents were, I had a tough life growing up, uh, went to Virginia Tech, got drafted by the Rams and got traded to the Packers and, you know, 11, 12 years, three Super Bowls, uh, very quiet, very unassuming team guy, but uh, he was always there. 
And so he invited me to an FCA camp between my, you know, what he did, he invited me to the chapel program in the National Football League. I said, even though that existed, every team in the NFL has chapel. They ha- they've been going, they've been having chapel since the 50s. And uh, Raymond Berry and Bill Glass were kind of the force behind that. A guy named Doc Eshelman, whose son was Paul Eshelman, did the Jesus film was like the unofficial chaplain of the NFL. So you get speakers or everywhere we went, they were usually business people, not pastors or priests. Uh-huh. And so I said, well, why not? You know, I'll go to church on Saturday night, fulfill my duty and obligation. And I'll go to this thing called chapel. And I started going to chapel. Now I may have heard this message growing up, but I, I don't know. But what these guys were saying that at some point in time in their life, they made a free will decision to open up their hearts to Christ and invite them into their life. I, I and I, and that was kind of like, mm, and had this personal relationship. My relationship was out of duty and obligation, trying to follow the law, trying to follow all the dictates of my faith. And, you know, I just was frustrated. And so I, I heard that message for a year. And then that off season between my rookie year and my second year, uh, my wife and Ikea, my late wife and Ikea went to uh, Mars Hill, North Carolina and Carol got us involved in FCA camp. By that time, your wife, Kia, had also... Um, no. Oh, no. Uh, no. Okay. All no, right. no. Oh, man. She thought I went crazy. She said, really? Okay. Who did I marry here? <laughs> oh, no. She's very, very devout Catholic. Two of her uncles were priests. And so we went to this camp, and it was a great experience. And uh, Bill Kreischer came up to me on Tuesday, and he asked me this question. He said, Mike, can you speak on Wednesday night? Because there were like 500 athletes there. And Del Sheely, who became president of FC years later, was the head coach. So I said, sure. What do you want me to talk about? And this is what he said to me. He says, talk about what it means to be a Christian pro athlete. Hmm. And I, had a, I said, I don't know if I'm a Christian or not. I'm a religious person. I believe wow. in Jesus. I don't know if I'm going to heaven. I don't, you know. And so it just struck me. And so by myself, you know, at that Mars Hill field, I just opened my heart and asked Christ to come in my life. And there was no birds, no, you know, I had some birds saying, but you no, know, there's no thing. And I told my wife about that and she kind of looked at me. Okay. And then uh, Wednesday night, you know, I just, yeah, I, I, and I never really spoke before crowds before like this. So I ended up uh, just telling what I did and uh, the rest uh, is history. Speaking of crowds, um, uh, and I, I think I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but all right. uh, with the Jesus Revolution, which mm-hmm. is the, you know the hottest movie out right about now, incredible. It is incredible. You um, actually, I lived through that era. You lived that area, but you were much more um, connected with it than I was because I was up in Seattle doing, uh, or actually in Spokane, Washington, doing a radio show. So I was oblivious to what was going on in the world at that time. Well, I was too. I was too to a certain really? extent. Okay, because yeah, I, I wasn't a hippie. You know, I was busy. You know, I had a couple of kids and working out and had, you know, we worked during the off season. And then I started going to the uh, Athletes in Action Conference for Pro Athletes in 71 in Dallas. My wife came. And then in 72, we had another one in February. And that's when she came forward to accept Christ into her heart. And I wish I could remember this black preacher who was the chaplain for the Washington Redskins at the time. He was a uh, gangbanger from New-, New Jersey, killed a lot of people. Whoa. And here's this white Whoa. Anglo-Saxon little petite blonde going up forward. And I said, okay. <laughs> and uh, her reaction was, she got mad. She said, how come I haven't heard this before? I said, well, we may have heard it before, but now we have, you know, I had to calm her down a little bit. Yeah. And uh, then that's when we went to Expo 72 in June of 72. That was the Jesus revolution rally. It was called Expo 72. They don't say that in, in the movie. And that was put on by Paul Eshman and Camus Crusade for Christ and Athletes in Action. So there was four or five of us, Dave Rowe, myself, um, Ed Mooney, uh, Roger Staubach, several other pros there. We were there all week. Then we'd come to the uh, come to the uh, stadium at night, Cotton Bowl, have a big rally. And uh, it, was, it was phenomenal. Then that Saturday, we're in the back seat driving to the rock festival with all these hippies. <laughs> well, they weren't hippies then, you know, but and so we're, you know, and Doc Eshman turns to me and said, Hey, Mike, uh, we got a problem. I said, what's that doc? I said, our speaker is not, is not, is ill. He can't speak. And there was, there was, there was, uh, uh, Chris Christophus in there. There was Johnny Cash. They had tons of speakers and, uh, phys- uh musicians. So he said, would you give your testimony for in, in a three minute testimony? I said, what? Oh my gosh. In front of that stage. He goes, yeah. And I looked at my wife. She goes, 
okay. <laughs> 250,000 so people there, right? This, this is oh, a crowd. Yeah, 200,000. It's on yeah. a freeway in Dallas. Yeah. I can't find it on the internet. Wish, wish we could find that. You know, then it was shown on TV and a bunch of guys back at Green Bay jumped all over me in August during training camp. <laughs> oh, we saw you on TV at this Jesus revolution. I said, yeah, okay. You know, so I had to take some grief there for a while, but they, they finally came around. From, from uh, Green Bay uh, to Oakland just for a year, but you had a, a key... Two seasons? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Come on, Rick. <laughs> Messed up my homework here. Yeah. Uh, John Madden was the coach. John Madden was the coach. And oh, yeah. you were responsible for bringing Chapel to well, the Raiders. I think so. But, you know, when I was traded, I felt pretty bad because we loved Green Bay. We had a home there. Um, Dan needed some draft choices. And uh, the Raiders just won the Super Bowl January of 77. And I had some good friends out there, Dave Rowe, Monty Johnson. That I met at the PAO conference. They had a little team Bible study under, I understood at that time. So I said, okay, Lord, you're closing one door and I got to go through this door. And it's not bad because it's 50, 53 degrees in December, not minus 50 degrees here <laughs> in Green Bay. So we went out there and uh, right towards the end of the exhibition season, I think I had one or two exhibition games left. So I went out there and got to, you know, you just feeling your way around a little bit, got to know these guys. And they're a tremendous, tremendous team. And eight guys from that team went to the Hall of Fame, mm. that team of, that won the Super Bowl. And they were named the top 50. They were named the top team in the first 50 years of the NFL. That's how good they were. <laughs> and we played against them my last year in Oakland. And I had, uh, I believe, three sacks against Kenny. And I just had one of those games. You know, I was in the zone. And uh, I think Al saw that. He says, hmm. So <laughs> I, was, I was on the team the next year. And uh, so we um, – so I said, I said, Monty, do we have chapel? He goes, no, I won't let it. I said, I said, why? He said, well, we don't know. But he just doesn't want chapel. I said, okay. So I'm kind of sitting around praying about it. And I said, well, I'm going to go see Al. You go, you're, you're what? Yeah, I'm going to go see, I like Mr. Davis. You know, he, he talked. And I really did. And uh, so I figured, you know, he just traded for me, you know, and he's not going to get rid of me right now because that wouldn't look too good. So I went up there and, and just talked to him on the silent, whatever it was. And I said, hey, Mr. Davis, um, you know, a lot of the teams in the NFL have chapel. And I said, yeah, Mike, I know about that. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a God guy. I said, well, that's good to hear, Mr. Davis. And I said, is there any reason we can't have chapel? And this is what he said to me. He says, I don't like outside people coming in. So he's very protective of those two days before the game. And I understand that. And I said, hmm, outside people. So I'm kind of sitting there. You know, it's the Holy Spirit thing. I said, well, Mr. Davis, what if we did it? And he goes, what do you mean, what if we did it? I said, one of the players did chapel. He said, okay. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Problem solved. And, uh, so the following Sunday, I think we had 18, 19 guys, three or four coaches, and the Bible study grew a little bit. And uh, later on, Al, Al actually hired a full-time chaplain at some point in time after I left. And uh, so that was a great experience with, with uh, Al Davis and that team and players there. And you'd mentioned PAO, so let's talk about that. Um, yeah, PAO is outreach. Professional Athletes Outreach, yep. uh, and yep. it is uh, it was originated back in that time, and, and you were a, a part of yeah. that. I was one of the original 12 committees members, yeah. and uh, it was formed, uh, the idea was formed after the 71 Athletes in Action Conference, because Paul, Paul and Doc knew that, you know, we got to give this, it's got to be pro to pro. It can't be us fighting FCA and us grabbing these pros and FCA get mad at us. You know, there's always that competition, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so they started that. And Arliss Priest was kind of the businessman behind it at that time. And so they asked us to contribute $5,000. Now, Rick, you got to understand, I was making $38,000 that year. <laughs> I, I said, that's, that's more crazy. than my time. <laughs> crazy. Wow. Yeah. So we did it. You know, we prayed about it. We did it. And so we formed uh, – the first the first year, which was which was seventy two, I believe, we uh, didn't even have a name yet. So Norm Evans was part of that, and uh, Dave Rowe and Monty Johnson, and just on and on and on. And so we uh, came up with the name Pro Athletes Outreach to reach pro athletes and their families, teach them uh, God's principles of living the Christian life, and it celebrated its fiftieth anniversary three years ago. Amazing, and it's still around. It doesn't and get a lot of publicity. They don't want that. And uh, so in 72, that's when my late wife, Kia, went forward. And, uh, and, and, and then, then we had the Rock Festival in 73. I think 73 was the kickoff for actually the, the, new, the new name, PAO. And, and Steve Stenstrom now is the and Norm. 
Evans became the president after he retired from the Seahawks for years. And uh, that has grown too from just uh, NFL to, the, to a, uh, yeah. the basketball. Yeah, we, had Waddy, we had Waddy Spolcher, who was a Detroit newscaster or newspaper guy in Detroit. And he came to one of the conferences. I want to start this in baseball. Because I guess the story, if I remember, his son was was dying. And he just says, Lord, <laughs> it's one of those things. If it happens, it happens. He said, Lord, I'll do anything you want me to do, but save my son. And he did. And he says, I want to start chapel in baseball. And that's how baseball chapel started. Interesting. And I was in hockey as well. Is there other sports? Uh, well, there is some, basketball has been a little tough, but I believe there are chaplains in basketball now. I, I haven't followed it that much, but I believe there are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, soccer, I'm not sure. And are you still active in PAO? No, 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 not at all. No, it's 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 an active it's an active ministry to active probes. I got you. So, although, I, although I kept knocking on the board, I said, you know, a lot of us guys are leaving, and we need to keep that connection. And they just they us do it just way too much to do that. And if it's okay, can we talk just a little bit about your uh, late wife Kia? She yes. was uh, a star in in and of herself. Uh, she Absolutely. was an ice skater, right? Yeah, right out of high school, she skated for ice skates. She grew up in Troy, New York. Her dad would take her to RIP when she was in fourth and fifth grade, skated at five o'clock in the morning. And then her sophomore year, uh, her world her world was crashed, crushed when her dad was transferred to General Electric in Erie, who's an organic chemist. And I always told her, I said, well, Kia, you wouldn't have met me. You know, it still didn't <laughs> It's not help. all bad. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so she uh, skated and she could have gone to the Olympics, didn't want to do that. They went to ice capades her first two years. And then when she got out, we we dated uh, we dated a little bit before she went to ice capades between her summer of her senior year and the summer of my freshman year at Notre Dame, and then we just kind of kept in touch. And then then she came out and I got called her up and and a little little bumpy at first, but it worked out. <laughs> and here here and then and then, and then she put the, you know then then we got married and 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 she taught in Green Bay for three or four years. Kids came along. She put the skates away about age twenty six. Then age 60, her sister, Monica, uh, was f- four or five years younger, kept skating all this time in these international adult ice figure skating championships. So we convinced my wife, late wife, Kia, to uh, skate in these. She says, Monica, it's been 30 years since I really put on a skate. They don't even fit anymore. So I was in Milwaukee speaking at some Catholic schools at that time, which I do now. So she called ahead and knew the people who ran the big rink there and ordered the skates and got fitted and started 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 training and she did that it became a girl thing and she did that for i think almost two and a half years and then in may of um, 2012 she was skating to amazing grace this is all on it's all on a website my son put together a tremendous website yes it she is skating she was skating to amazing grace and won that competition but she had a little sore in her thigh we didn't know what it was so by the time she got home, it was probably about 10 days after everything worked out and she got back to the States, there was something sticking out of her thigh and it was our home. Oh. And uh, we found out about it uh, July 5th in 2012. And it just grew like crazy. And then she passed away. She lived her life in grace and dignity. And she passed away in grace and dignity in March of uh, March 28th, just a couple of days ago in 2013. How did your faith help you through all of that and help her through all of that? I don't know. You know, I'm still kind of struggling with that, to tell you the truth. But uh, grief is something else. I I, I, I think at first, I, I'm this big Christian guy. I'm, you know, I'm out there preaching the word and uh, doing full-time ministry since 1986. I got out of the league in 1980. And uh, I said, you know, all right, I got to go on with life. And I didn't let the grieving process happen. And uh, and it cost me and hmm. emotionally. And it cost me in some other ways, but uh, I'm doing a lot better now, even though it's 10 years down the road. But, uh, you know, it was friends that came around me and it was my family and, of course, my faith, you know. And my biggest hope was that I knew where she was and I knew she was in the presence of Jesus. She's out of pain, no more pain, no more tears. I know at some point in time when I'm called home that I will see her. So that aspect of my faith really, really helped me. And then I got real busy. And I just started going, going, going. And then I crashed a little bit. And then after a couple of years, and then um, and now now it's kind of evening out. Are you, um, a, 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 w- 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 is that the um, most 
I'm assuming the most dramatic moment when you were yeah you were asking where is God? Why isn't he you know responding to our prayers for healing? Um, was you know, there uh, any of that no, going on? No, none of that. You know, because you have to trust him. And I know very few people are healed when you look at the number of people that die as Christians. There are some, and you hear about it. That's God's providence. That's up to him. But I think what happened with him, with my wife is that she journaled. And she had journals all over the home. And I knew she was journaling. And I was gone a lot then. I was with Bill. I was with Doc Eshelman's group and Bill Gallup class for 19 years. And I have my own ministry now, Mike McCoy Ministries, the last 11 years even though she wasn't around for that just for a year, two years. And um, so my son started reading these journals and a friend of mine, Larry Schrader says, why don't you write a book? And I said, I'm not writing a book. And Caleb says, well, dad, I'll do it. And he was unencumbered at that time. He was full-time Christian work in France at a camp called Camp of the Peaks. So he took a couple months off and got the journals and, and wrote the book, Angel and Ice, and then developed a website called angelandice.com. And I, and I thought it was going to be... I thought it was going to be uh, a big hit, so I ordered I ordered five thousand copies. <laughs> <laughs> I said, "Okay, God, here we go." You know, yeah. But what happened is, you know, your friends and your family they buy the copies, and then after that, it, it kind of dwindled. And I don't know why, because I did have a marketing person, but probably not the right one. But what happened is, is that we got a call from the Cancer Society. My son did he says, "Can you come to the walkathons and set up a booth and give your books away to these cancer patients and families?" they read oh. the book and that's what we did gave away probably i would say four thousand books in five wow. years yeah five years six years wow i still have some left and now and, and then it's on amazon it's um oh what's that digital stuff you know <laughs> digital stuff it's there i did so see god that used that you know god used her her life and i always tell my my close friends i said i think jesus like Kia so much that he wanted to bring her home so you could hang with her because she was that <laughs> sweet of a person. And uh, that's my, that's McCoy theology. But yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah. That's so that, that, that didn't turn out. But what's happening now is Rona Barrett for Media Lightworks. Yeah. She uh, looked at the book about two years ago, sent us a contract. And I had a friend of mine, Bob Madden out of California, said, Mike, they're tiny up forever. And I said, I can't sign this. Because Mike McCoy Ministries owns the rights. And they contacted my son because he's trying to become an actor. Uh, and uh, <laughs> tough, tough, tough. It's uh, a tough business. Think, yes, it you is. You think the NFL is tough and brutal? Be, trying to become an actor? You get thousands of these young people, men and women, and yeah. hope, 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 you know? Yeah. And they sent us the contract, but they put it for six months. So I signed it. So what they're doing, they're, they're, they're shopping this story to producers, executive producers who come up with the money to film this thing. So let me just to repeat, the name of the um, website is Angel on Ice, and the name of the book is Angel on Ice. Yeah, dot and, com. Dot com. Uh, yeah, dot com. And, and the book is Angel on Ice. Um, right. And I did take a look at that uh, video that's on the website, yeah. and it's it's fantastic. As she's skating to Amazing Grace. Yep. Wow. Very yeah, There's interviews, and you know she had her femur taken out. They put a rod in there and how she fought that. Yeah. Then we went to Rome <laughs> in mid-February. Her sister's crazy, Monica. Let's go to Rome. I said, come on. I said, no. I said, I always wanted to go to Rome. And so we asked the cancer guy. I said, sure. So we went to Rome and with my two oldest granddaughters, I'll never forget that. And my sister-in-law and her husband and off we went. Wow. Uh, and so we figured that we're going to uh, go to the Vatican. And I had some seminarian friends that were going to take us on a tour and so we said, nobody's going to be there, February, whatever it was. Well, that was the day Pope Benedict resigned. There was really? two, there was a quarter of a million people. Oh, man. St. Peter's Square. So they got us right up front. And if you've ever seen St. Peter's Square, there's St. Peter right here with the keys. And we were 10, 20 feet in, in a row where, where the, where the uh, wheelchairs were. And my two granddaughters went, went to, with the seminary students. So they got right, right up front in the middle. And here comes Benedict in his Pope mobile, comes up, comes up stops right in front of us and i had to move my foot because i was going to run it over really? and my wife was looking at him and he looked at her and someone handed him a baby and he kissed the baby and uh, then he went off and so one of the seminarian friends found a picture from this side so kia was sitting over here he got this oh. picture from this side so you're looking at this picture it, it, and the pope mobile is 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 it 
it is bright. I can't even see myself. Everything else is dark. And my wife is bright. Wow. And I said, wow. Yeah, that was that was a pretty powerful picture. So God, you know, God sent some really interesting things. Can I tell you another story? Absolutely. Her first year, they went to France to skate with her sister. And some of my kids went, some of the girls. And so they're sitting at a table. And this gentleman comes up and gives a a, uh, a daffodil to my wife. And, you know, pretty lady, here you go. And so she saw that as a sign from her dad because he loved daffodils. And uh, so then they bought, yeah. bought a clock. It was just a circular clock, had a base, and it was gold. Didn't even work. Put it in our master bedroom for, what, a year, year and a half? So she passed away at 5 o'clock on March 28th. <laughs> she was on hospice at the home. And uh, so I had to go call it in. So I call it in. And then Monica, my sister, says, you know, go we'll clean everything up. So I went to the clubhouse that where we lived. And some of my, one of my friends came up. And, you know, I've been up for 24, 25 hours. So I went back in. And, and Monica says, Mike, look at the clock. I said, Monica, the clock never worked. She says, look at the clock. Yeah, it's 501. She died at 501. Wow. Yeah. Man, oh, man. Yeah. God speaks yeah. in amazing ways. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I'm getting yeah. shivers. Getting yeah, shivers. I got, yeah. I got some more stories, but I think our time is probably. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, cause I really want to get into, you know, we've talked a lot of football, but uh, the most of your life is not, a, has been, not a been other than the reflections on the football years. It's yeah. been totally a service to God. Uh, yeah, I'm 74 years old. At, yeah, at, at 74. So tell me, so out of that um, post-football era, you were with right. Bill Glass. and well, that- when I got out of the league, we moved back to Pennsylvania, and uh, I was a managing partner of a racquetball club. I was I also had a veal farm. I was raised in kosher veal. This is in Jimmy Carter era, and uh, it was pretty tough. And so I'm saying, okay. And uh, then I found out that the veal business was run by the mafia. And I probably shouldn't say that because they may come after me. But and I said, I got to get out of this. So I had the racquetball court. Then I took a test to get my license to sell stocks and bonds. And I flunked the test. Yeah. And I'm, a, I'm an economics graduate from Notre Dame. And I flunked the test. And I never, I'll never forget, I'm in this little farmhouse. And I'm crying. I said, okay, I flunked the test. She goes, well, take it again. She never gave me any slack. Yeah. Oh, no sympathy <laughs> at all. Yeah. And so I took it again and I passed. Then I worked for a company that was selling... Uh, uh, salary reduction to nonprofits like hospitals. Oh, wow. Did very, very well with that. And then I got a call from Doc in 86. He said, this culture is going, going to hell. We want to take some former pro athletes and here's the salary and do you want to go? And so my wife and I prayed about it. And my son, I think, was in third or fourth grade. So all the kids were already up. So she took a job to help support the family. And I, and I went full time with Doc in 86 and then 89. Um, I moved to Atlanta Then 91, uh, I lost, I, I got, uh, I got another door closed with doc and door Bill glass calls me up. He said, Hey, you know, we're looking for somebody to take over the, uh, youth program because we're a prison ministry. We really don't have a youth program. So it was a natural for me and, uh, continued to train pros at that time and go into public schools. And I started the Catholic school outreach and I was on staff for 19 years. And uh, 2007, 2008 hit, and the downturn. I said, okay. I kind of saw it coming because I turned down moving to Dallas three times. I, did, I said, that's not me. I, said, I, I need to be on the field. I'm not going to sit in an office and just run on the ministry, which is, is fine with some people. That was not my gift. Thank God I knew that because I would have I would have crashed and burned if I did that. And uh, so he laid, he laid 50% of the staff off in two weeks. So I'm 60 years old. And I'm sitting in Marin County, and I and I was still under the umbrella of Bill Glass, and I was doing a Catholic school, Marin County Catholic. And I just got done with it, and I still didn't have the word that we're going to be laid off. I just kind of sensed it, you know. And uh, I said, but you know, God, it would be kind of interesting if I just spoke in Catholic schools. And then I heard this voice, and I've never heard a voice before from God because the Holy Spirit kind of speaks to our heart. And I heard, go ahead and do it. And I, and I was shocked. I had to turn around and make sure there was nobody in the back seat. Really? Yeah. That's so I amazing. Came back to, I came back to Atlanta. My good friend, Monty Johnson, helped me uh, organize ministry with my board and got me some funding. 
and off I've gone. And it's been 11 years now. And we reach students in Catholic schools with the message of faithful encouragement. We do that with two programs. And the first program is grades three through five is the value and worth of a person through God's eyes. And because these young people are getting the culture, and, and the Satan is so, so alive in this culture. And so we're trying to teach them within a 40 minute assembly is, you know, who are they in Christ? And I, and I put in some funny stories, you know, when I was growing up and snowball and getting beat up by the kids and, you know, and then the other one is grade six through 12 is decisions determine our destiny. And it's an hour program. And, uh, and then at that one, we have comment cards, feedback time. And, uh, and then we ask the kids to stand. They want to pray to receive Christ. And I was at an assembly last Wednesday at a Catholic school in the middle of Wisconsin and 425 kids stood up and prayed to receive Jesus as their savior. So wow. I think there is a revival going on. I think, I think this generation is like the hippie generation. You know, what's going on? They may not be, you know, they may not dress like the hippies, but they still have searching. And because their faith is not working for them, the culture is not working for them. Am I a man or a woman? Uh, you know, what's going on? And uh, so when I hear the truth and the unconditional love, that's what got me. You know, I couldn't earn by, I deserve God's love. That, that, I've go back and that's, that's really what did it for me. It's called grace. Yeah. And, uh, and I talk about grace and that, those assemblies. So we get these comment cards and I read some student comments that I got from Catholic students the last eight or nine years, anywhere from suicide to cutting to depression to family problems, drugs and alcohol. And then I'm clean. I've got good friends. So I balance it out. So uh, your decision to just do Catholic schools, is that just because you got to yeah. focus? I'm done. I'm, you know, I, I used to do public schools, but it's so difficult the last 15 years. I don't even try. Yeah. You know, oh, this, I'm going to talk about chapel. Oh, you going to talk about God? I said, yeah. Mm. <laughs> you know, we don't know, you know, so I just, you know, God, yeah. go where, go where I can, go where I can preach. Yeah. It, I yeah, do that's... parishes and I do youth groups and parishes because a lot of those kids are public school students. And as you, you know, all I do is quote, all I do is quote John Paul II. Great, great quote. He said this, do not fear, open your heart to Christ. Conversion is a personal decision accepting the saving sovereignty of Christ and his grace and, and becoming his follower. So it's a choice we make. Then we take that, build the foundation of that relationship and build it through our faith. And they, they get it. Yeah. They get it. Well, Mike, do you have a life verse uh, a scripture verse. Yeah, there's there's tons of them. Uh, Galatians two twenty. I've been crucified on the cross with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live in the faith in the Son of God who loved me and saved me. Because it's not me. It's called exchange life. And uh, and, uh, and uh, Dr. Anderson. I read his books. They were great. And because I was burnt out with ministry, I said this is terrible. I'm out there raising funds. I'm tired. My my family's tired. And I and I was trying, trying, trying. And then when I finally even I understood grace, but when I finally realized that I'm just a conduit and it's not up to me, God's going to get it. I'm not going to get it. I just put in, I just put the worms out there and he, and he, and he brings the worms home. And, um, and that's been a real, I still struggle sometimes when I, when I kind of look at my schedule for the fall, I said, okay, Lord, you know, I need a couple more. And it actually <laughs> happens. Yeah. 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 Very cool. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Um, God bless what you're doing and um, anything that we can do, or uh, I'd love to keep in touch just to, to Absolutely. find out what, well, you're, what you're trying to get out to Seattle. Yes. I'm trying to get out to Seattle. Are you in Seattle? I, I'm just outside of Seattle, about 30 miles, 60 miles south of Seattle. Yeah. Well, if anybody's in Seattle and they know Justina King or Pam Schwartz from the diocese, Catholic diocese office, for schools. I've been calling them on the phone. So if anybody has some real good relationship with those two ladies, I would love to network. Okay. All right. And it's uh, McCoy77.com, angelonice.com. And uh, you'll you be blessed by going to Angel on Ice. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. All right. Have a great Take rest care. of your day. All right. All right. Bye bye. Wow. There you have it the Mike McCoy story, the highlights, the challenges and the powerful impact that God has made through it all. Please take a minute, share, subscribe, and like this episode of Amazing Grace as together we continue to grow the pod and share the word. God bless.